Thanks, Loella. Uh, it's great to be here. It's nice to see all of you um, and, and join you tonight. And thanks for taking some time out of uh, uh, what I assume are very busy schedules and, and uh, away from your families and your homes. Uh, so uh, it's super uh, important. I want to acknowledge uh, today I'm on the unceded and traditional territories of the Kakite First Nation, which is uh, more colonially known as New Westminster, uh, where there are some uh, very interesting conversations going on about renaming the city and, and things and uh, and all of that. And so uh, as the municipal elections play out and conversations with the Indigenous uh, communities in this area, um, you know, we will be following that closely, uh, uh, particularly in this time. And just uh, uh, important to acknowledge today, uh, particularly around um, Truth and Reconciliation Day tomorrow, uh, you know, that, uh, that we keep that uh, in our hearts and in our minds and that we go into the night uh, in a good way and do some good work with open, open hearts and, and listening. I'm glad uh, that we get to have this conversation this evening. Uh, we've been uh, working and for some time not being able to access work uh, for many people in the pandemic for the last uh, more than two years has uh, forced us collectively to look at accessibility more widely than I think many of us had previously. We've learned about accessibility in the context of online learning environments, public health policies, legislative requirements, and access to mental health supports during a time of collective trauma. As we continue to broaden our understanding of disability and accessibility, we also be firmer in our resolve to strengthen protections that are in place for workers. We've done extensive work through our Workers Deserve Better campaign to the fact that WCB is in dire need of change. We've supported the provincial government rule out of the Accessible BC Act, which I know uh, Marjorie will speak about later on. Uh, we have a rep on the Provincial Accessibility Committee, Cheryl Burns, who will, you will also hear from later. Uh, and that's some of the work that we've been directly involved in. But just as important as that work we do in our committees and in our unions and at the BC Federation of Labor is the work that is being done in community. So we have my friend Heather, uh, who's gonna share with us shortly about their experience creating organization through empowering themselves and others to take action to make their community more accessible. And of course, we need to acknowledge uh, the incredible work of community advocacy organizations like the Community Legal Assistance Society where Kevin Love has been doing groundbreaking work representing underserviced um, clientele and combating stigma and human rights violations through the legal system. So thank you to the Workers with Disability Caucus members of the BC Federation of Labor for planning this event. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the program and thank you all for taking time to be here. Back over to you, Luella. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you for all of your support for us at the Human Rights Standing Committee over the years. It's been a pleasure to work with you. I'd now like to introduce you to our first panelist, Marjorie Pastor. Pronouns are she and her. Marjorie is a staff lawyer at the Disability Law Clinic, where she advises people with disabilities on a variety of legal issues, including human rights and discrimination. Opened in March 2020 with funding from the Law Foundation of BC, the Disability Law Clinic is the first nonprofit community legal clinic in BC that specializes in disability rights law. Over to you, Marjorie. Thank you. Um, it's so great to be here this evening. It's always nice to spend time with labor activists in, uh, in a physical room or a virtual room. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am joining from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And it's so important and I'm still learning how to always keep in mind, or I mean, it's easy to keep in mind the fact that we all work within colonial structures. And especially as a lawyer, I mean, I'm gonna to talk to you about legislation today, which is perhaps one of the most colonial things that there is. Um, I think the challenge is thinking about, okay, I can think about that and keep that in mind, but then um, what does that mean that I ought to do differently or how do I attempt to be slightly less colonial in my approach uh, to what I do? Um, uh, but it's always nice to take the opportunity to reflect on that at these moments at the beginnings of meetings. 
when we are acknowledging where it is that we're that we're joining meetings from or where it is that we're hosting the meetings. So um, my name is Marjorie. I am, as Luella introduced, a staff lawyer at the Disability Law Clinic, which is a program at Disability Alliance BC. And before I launch into the legislation, I just want to say a little bit about those organizations, just in case there's anyone in the room who isn't aware of who or what they are. Although I think given the size of the room and the group that's here, perhaps you all already are aware. Um, so Disability Alliance BC is an organization that's been around since 1977. It is a provincial cross-disability voice in British Columbia. It used to be called the BC Coalition of People with Disabilities. And the mission is to support people with all disabilities to live with dignity, independence, and as equal and full participants in the community. The organization has done a variety of systemic advocacy, but since the late 80s has also provided direct services. Um, at the moment, we assist people to access government supports, uh, including the Persons with Disabilities Benefit, CPP Disability, the Disability Tax Credit, and Registered Disability Savings Plans. We also assist people in filing their taxes, and we also have a program called the Right Fit Program, which matches people who need accessible housing with appropriate housing. I meant to start a timer. Okay, it's 517. That'll be my timer. Keeping an eye on my time. Um, and the another program at Disability Alliance BC is the Disability Law Clinic, which, as was mentioned, has been open since March 2020. Uh, and I am a staff lawyer there. And we provide summary advice and referral services, um, lots of referral services uh, for summary advice. We have a slightly more narrow scope of things that we give advice about, but we, and that includes uh, accessibility laws, which I'll talk about today and access to services generally, uh, discrimination and human rights, specifically as it relates to disability, whether that be in the workplace or accessing services like transportation or post-secondary education. We also give advice about decision-making rights. Um, people have questions about removing committeeship, for example, or where the public guardian and trustee is involved. And we also advise, uh, give advice about long-term disability insurance, mostly appeals related to long-term disability insurance. So that's us. Uh, it's very exciting to be a part of this clinic. I've been a big fan of the Arch Disability Legal Center in Toronto for a long time and um, used to dream about working there, except that I didn't want to live in Toronto. So it's pretty neat that there's a clinic in BC now. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of it. So I was going to kick us off by talking a little bit about the two pieces of legislation that have come into existence and into force recently. I'm going to start with the Accessible Canada Act, which is the federal legislation. Um, Canada brought this in to fulfill its commitment to accessibility under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Canada ratified in 2010. The act came into force in 2019. And the purpose of the legislation, um, actually, I'm going to pause to ask Cassandra if it's possible for someone on your side to share the slides that I had sent. Yes, just great. One more. Uh, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, I had a few like quotes from the legislation that I thought would be nice to have visible um, so that you're not just counting on hearing me say, say the things. Um, so the purpose of the Accessible Canada Act is to create a barrier-free Canada by 2040, which is a pretty nice and lofty, lofty goal. Um, by barriers, when we talk about what barrier-free Canada means, the legislation defines barrier in a pretty all-encompassing way. It's a uh, barrier is anything, including anything physical, architectural, technological, or attitudinal, anything that's based on information or communications, or anything that is the result of a policy or a practice that hinders, 
the full and equal participation in society of persons with an impairment, including a physical, mental, intellectual, cognitive, learning, communication, or sensory impairment, or a functional limitation. So like I said, pretty all-encompassing. Uh, and this is where good timing, I think we'll be able to see the definition up on the screen. One more. There. Um, yes, okay, so that's, that's what the legislation is talking about when it wants to remove all of those barriers um, by 2040. Um, so the idea is proactive identification, removal, and prevention of barriers to accessibility. There are seven key priority areas. I'm not going to list them because I worry I'm going slower than I thought I would. Um, but they include employment, and they include transportation and the built environment. There are seven. They're, they're fairly all-inclusive as well. It applies, of course, as you would expect with federal legislation only to federally regulated entities. So it applies to the Government of Canada departments and agencies. It applies to Crown Corporations, Parliament, the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCMP, and then of course to your mostly big, I'm gonna say big, I think of them as big, uh, banking, telecoms, and transportation companies. Um, what the Act does, is creates a national accessibility week which starts the last sunday in may coincidentally the british columbia legislation also creates a provincial accessibility week also starting the last sunday in may um the act recognizes asl qsl and indigenous sign languages as primary languages of deaf people in canada the app says that organizations it applies to must publish and prepare accessibility plans, set up a feedback process, and prepare and publish progress reports. Um, and so those organizations that it applies to, uh, the act doesn't set this out, but the regulation sets out that there are now deadlines in place. So the deadline for the federal government Crown corporations, parliamentary entities, the RCMP, and the Canadian Armed Forces, they all have to prepare and publish their first accessibility plans by December 31st, 2022, which is coming right up. Um, so that's the first round. And then large businesses with 100 or more employees must prepare and publish their first accessibility plans by June 1st, 2023. Actually, if you go ahead two slides, I have these deadlines. One more. There it is. Um, and then small businesses uh, must prepare and publish their first accessibility plan by June 1st, 2024. So that's one thing that creates this obligation for people to have accessibility plans. It also creates Accessibility Standards Canada, which is an organization which will develop and revise accessibility standards. Those standards would be voluntary unless they were turned into regulations. But the and so Accessibility Standards Canada can recommend that some of them become regulations. Uh, there aren't any standards yet. Apparently, there are technical committees that have been struck, but no standards published yet. Um, the Act also creates an accessibility commissioner who has the responsibility and ability to enforce the Act in specific priority areas, which is kind of neat. Uh, enforcement is always something I'm interested in. I don't know if that's just the lawyer training, but I also think it's the pragmatic, what does this mean unless it can be enforced question. Uh, so the commissioner can use penalties to enforce rules. Uh, this, this came into effect via regulation. And penalties range from $250 up to $250,000, depending on if an organization has a minor, uh, a minor violation, which might be not publishing an access accessibility plan, or a major violation, which might mean not following an order from the accessibility commissioner, or a very major mi violation, which uh, could be lying to the accessibility commissioner. Anyway, but they can impose they can impose penalties, so that's good. They can also receive complaints from individuals, or at least. They should be able to this is also not something that's happening yet, um, I think everything is still slowly unfolding but um but the legislation outlines that individuals 
will be able to um, complain. There will be a, a system in place for individuals to complain. And also, it's not just the commissioner who can receive complaints because complaints related to certain areas can go, can be dealt with through other places as well. For example, uh, the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board can deal with accessibility complaints for federal public services via the grievance process. So that will all be very great once things are actually, well, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens when, when these plans are, yeah, I'll say when these plans are published um, and when, and when the stand, if, when, yeah, if, when, I'll go with when, when standards are, are published. Um, that was most of what I wanted to say about the federal legislation, although if you go back two slides, I did want to pause um, because we were talking yesterday as a group of panelists about definitions of disability, and I thought that the definition that the legislation provided um, was interesting because, as you'll see on the slide, it the definition in the legislation is disability means any impairment, including a physical, mental, intellectual, cognitive, learning, communication, or sensory impairment, or a functional limitation, whether permanent, temporary, or episodic in nature, or evident or not, that in interaction with a barrier, hinders a person's full and equal participation in society. And I, for one, really like that it encompasses both of those things, like it's not really about I'll use the word impairment. It's really about how that interacts with a barrier that's preventing someone from fully and equally participating in society. So I thought that was an interesting definition in the legislation. It is not as all in the British Columbia legislation is not as all encompassing uh, as we will see in a moment. Um, so that's all that I had to say about that. Checking in on time. No, I can't see the time because it's now full screen. Okay, I better move on to accessible, the Accessible British Columbia Act. Um, so if we move forward a couple of slides, uh, that's, the, that's the citation. If we move, move forward to the next one, I don't remember what the slide says, but um, all right. So this act was assented to on June 17th, 2021. And what does it do? So it, also creates an accessibility week, as I mentioned. It also recognizes ASL and Indigenous Sign Languages as primary languages of communication by deaf persons in BC. And it creates a Provincial Accessibility Committee, which I think, I hope Cheryl will say a few more words about uh, when, when, when it's her turn. Um, among other things, I think the uh, Provincial Accessibility Committee can create standards. I don't know if Cheryl's going to talk about that or not. I sort of hope she does. Um, and it says that organizations the act applies to must establish an accessibility committee to identify barriers and ways to remove them, create some outlines for who should be on that committee, like at least half of the committee should be persons with disabilities and at least one person should be indigenous, and it should otherwise reflect the diversity of people living in British Columbia. The committee should establish, so organizations should establish a committee, develop a plan to remove barriers, and establish a process for receiving public feedback. Um, I put the definition of barrier there because I thought it was interesting in comparison, but I'm not going to say anything about it. But the next slide, um, something that's quite inter or quite important, I think, or something that D DABC certainly didn't like about this act is that the definition of impairment doesn't include, so it says physical, sensory, mental, intellectual, or cognitive impairment, but it doesn't include learning or communication, which is a gap uh, and is something that is included in the federal legislation. Um, so what the act does not do is it does not apply to private sector organizations. So as of September 1st, 2022, um, we do know who this, who this act applies to. It's all public sector organizations. Uh, and there are deadlines in place for those organizations where they have to create um, create these these committees and these plans. Um, so for many many uh, organizations, the deadline is September first, twenty twenty three. That includes school districts, municipalities, public sec uh, post secondary education institutions, 
uh, health authorities get a bit of a break. They don't have to have this in place until September 1st, 2024. And there are some other organizations that don't have to have a plan in place until, or committee in place until 2024. But all of these organizations, there's a lot of them, they're all public sector organizations. So this doesn't apply to the private sector at all, which is also a big gap. Um, Lost track of what else it doesn't do. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't apply to private sector organizations. It doesn't include um, communication or uh, or learning disabilities in its definition of impairment and disability. And uh, DABC published a position paper about what it doesn't do and what we think it ought to do better. Oh, also, there's no enforcement mechanism. Uh, no enforcement mechanism, no individual complaints process, and no timelines. So the Accessible Canada Act says, let's create a barrier-free Canada by 2040. Yay. Uh, this doesn't have any timelines at all. Um, and if anyone's interested, DABC has a position paper about that, which I can send you. The final thing that I will say about this is, as committees are needing to be struck for these public sector, organizations. Um, DABC is part of a project to help um, develop resources and support for those committees. And if we go ahead to the second to last slide, this is just a website. It's still a bit of a skeleton website, but um, hopefully it will be less skeleton over time. And, and in the meantime, it does have some information and some contact information. And the hope is that through the website and through the project, I will be able to provide committees with resources to help do the things that they're required to do under the act um, in the way of toolkits and templates and training and hopefully not recreating the wheel because this has been done in other places and hopefully we can not recreate the wheel but perhaps do it better and that is where i will end my comments thank you marjorie it's so important for us as working people and as advocates to be well aware of what the laws are around accessibility, provincially and federally. So I thank you for that. Our next panelist is Heather McCain, pronouns they and them. Heather McCain is founder and executive director of Creating Accessible Neighborhoods or CAN, a nonprofit since a nonprofit they started in 2005. Heather built CAN from a small grassroots organization in two communities to an organization delivering workshops and adding their voice to projects and events across Turtle Island, colonial known as North America. Heather works on the stolen land of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Salehutu in what is colonial known, colonially called Vancouver. Too many whys in that for me. Heather, thank you for being here and over to you. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. So note that I will be describing any images that are on the slides, and this is to ensure that blind and partially sighted people have access to visual information. I come to you today from the stolen and traditional land of the Squamish people. This slide has a photograph of sunlight filtering through trees at Seymour Provincial Park, which is Squamish land in what is colonially known as North Vancouver. This acknowledgement is a tiny piece in the larger context of the ongoing work that is necessary to challenge the legacies of colonialism and create disruptive change and true reconciliation. Decolonialization work aims to break down interpersonal, societal, and systemic barriers, and it must include our inherent ableism. 30 to 35 percent of Indigenous people in Canada self-identify as having a disability. Many have those disabilities because of collective trauma and oppression that is the result of colonialization and an ongoing genocide. Disability awareness must be a part of moving away from our colonial practices. This slide has a photograph of a totem pole with a border of wavy lines and a blue sky. 
So 20% of the world's population self-identify as having some form of disability. In Canada, is 25% for non-Indigenous and 30 to 35 for Indigenous. This represents the world's largest and fastest growing minority. People with disabilities are the third largest com community in terms of purchasing power behind China and the United States. And disability is also the only minority group that any of us can become a member of at any time. So disability has multiple definitions. The following definitions were written by myself, Heather McCain, Corn Parsons, and Ingrid Palmer. Disability is an umbrella term for a condition that affects a person's senses, brain, and or body, and which restricts their ability to go about their daily life. Disability is a legal category entitling individuals to certain accommodations and protections. Disability is a category of social differences maintained through systemic marginalization, including ableism and intersecting oppressions. And a, dis a definition that's often left out of the conversation is that disability is an identity, a source of pride, and a foundation for a community that is connected through shared histories, geographies, and communities that, uh, and cultures that may additionally or alternatively include chronically ill, capital D deaf, lowercase d deaf, neurodivergent, mad, and many more. Crip and mad are two terms that the disabled people are reclaiming, much as the 2S LGBTQIA plus community did with the term queer. Please keep in mind that crip and mad should not be used by non-disabled people. It's important to keep in mind that the earlier statistics are people who are currently diagnosed and self-identify and not a true reflection of how many people actually live with disability. So for example, Indigenous people do not have equitable access to health services due to a variety of factors, uh, including geography. Indigenous people face intersecting challenges such as colonialism, bias, lack of compassion and or respectful care, and culturally unsafe care. Autism research is male-centric, leaving many women and gender non-conforming people undiagnosed as their characteristics may be different. Black people are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and when diagnosed, they're less likely to receive accommodation and or treatment. Creating more accessible spaces for all is important because of the social factors that leave many behind and undiagnosed. Please consider how requiring a diagnosis may prevent people who need access from receiving it. CAN's focus is on education. All too often, organizations, businesses, governments, and individuals adopt disability policies and say they are increasing accessibility, yet have not done the first step of learning about the broad spectrum of disability encompasses and how ableism shows up in our society and interpersonal interactions. CAN has been trusted with the stories of those who have lived expertise, and we work with organizations to help them understand why this work is expected of them and how they can find joy and curiosity in it instead of doing it as a ticking the box exercise. The photo on this slide shows a conference room of participants at one of our workshops. In our education work, we prioritize decolonization and use both an intersectional and disability justice lens. The term disability justice was created in 2005 from conversations between black, brown, queer and trans people in reaction to their exclusion from the mainstream disability movement and studies and the focus on straight white males with physical disabilities. Disability justice is an ongoing practice that recognizes the inherent worth of every person and sees us as whole beings with different strengths and needs. Disability justice challenges us the ways we think about and label our bodies, brains, minds, and senses. CAN is hired by clients to deliver workshops and do accessibility audits. Following are three examples. CAN was hired by the Polygon Gallery in North Vancouver and the Bill Reed Gallery of Northwest Coast Art to do accessibility audits and workshops. At the Polygon Gallery, we taught our disability awareness and gender and sexuality workshops for staff. This slide has a photo of the wide open space available in the main gallery at the Polygon. 
At the Bill Reed Gallery, we delivered our disability awareness workshop and a second customized disability awareness workshop focused on frontline staff interactions with patrons with disabilities. We also did a walkthrough of their gallery with the operations coordinator and director and CEO, and we pointed out where they were accessible and where they had room for improvement. Following a successful disability awareness workshop for staff at the City of Vancouver in June, CAN has been hired by the City to create ongoing disability awareness training for staff at all levels. The City recently approved an accessibility strategy. Our training will be a vital component for staff to understand why the accessibility strategy is needed and how they can be an active participant in the City becoming anti-ableist. Creating Accessible Neighborhoods works with clients to help them create accessibility statements and or protocols. The Bill Reed Gallery um, created a page on their website for their statement of commitment and accessibility information. An example of information that you might find in an accessibility protocol is that for a conference, it would outline that all speakers are to use microphones. This slide has a photo of a mic with a blurred crowd in the background. I worked with an organization who utilized this at a conference. Organizers told people at the start of the conference to call in speakers when they didn't use microphones. This takes the weight of expectation off of the shoulders of disabled people. It shares the responsibility of accessibility because accessibility is the responsibility of all of us. All too often microphones are available, but speakers say that they can talk loud enough or they ask everyone if they can hear, not thinking about the fact that people don't often like to single themselves out in work or unsafe environments. At the end of the conference, several participants came up to us to say how much that mattered to them. It was the first event they had ever participated in where they didn't have to remind speakers to use mics because the speakers either used them or others reminded them. Several said they were used to hearing less than half of conferences, and it was the first time where they actually heard everything. An accessibility protocol is a living document. It expands, adapts, and changes as you get feedback and learn. Society has a sameness problem. We've created boxes and expect people to fit them. And when they don't, those people are isolated and excluded, made to feel unwanted. Throughout our lives, we hear and see messages that continually tell us that we have to be the same as others. This slide shows a field of yellow flowers with one red poppy. For example, let's look at the education system. A common ableist narrative in education is that there are correct ways to speak, to read, and to have mobility. From a young age, educational institutions prioritize and value verbal language over sign language, reading print over braille or ebooks or audiobooks, creating environments for children who walk, but only meeting the barest minimum requirements for children who roll. The point that is repeated for a child's entire educational experience is that disabled students are to copy non-disabled students. There is a prejudice against doing activities in a way that is more efficient or easier for people with disabilities, but is not how non-disabled people do them. These ableist assumptions create inequities and unfairness and disadvantage those with disabilities. We all need to think about how we participate in keeping people in boxes that they may not fit. We can work to change to recognize and celebrate people for who they are and what they have to offer. And we need to understand that we are not all the same and that is okay. So this sameness problem leads to rules and policies that are inequitable. We need to question, dismantle, learn, and unlearn. For example, ask who gets to set the parameters of what is and isn't good behavior and professionalism. Typically, the parameters are set by non-marginalized people who are trying to control others and gatekeep positions of power. We need to unlearn what often makes others feel like imposters and as if they don't have an active role in the environment. Their behavior may not be intentionally disruptive, but rather the way that they need to be in order to participate. Examples include someone fidgeting may not be a 
uh, is trying to concentrate. Someone using a computer may not be able to write out notes. Someone on their device may be trying to stay awake. I often play solitaire during meetings because I'm on a lot of medications and tend to fall asleep when sitting still and listening. My plane isn't disrespectful, but rather it's me trying to keep my brain working so that I can concentrate on what is being discussed. Someone with sunglasses may be dealing with a migraine, someone walking or stretching a lot may be in pain, and someone participating online with their camera off may be juggling other duties, such as working, looking after older relatives or children, and household duties. Rebecca Tussig, in her book Sitting Pretty, gives voice to the emotional toll of inaccessibility. She says, many days I feel too vulnerable to leave my house, too fed up to subject myself to the gamble of strangers interacting with me, too tired to fight to occupy a corner of space. Inaccessibility over time tells me that I do not matter. I am not wanted, do not belong. This land wasn't made for me. So I stay in, keep to myself, avoid, cancel plans, carry anxiety in each fold and bend of my body, feel very alone and trapped and helpless. As author Ajima Alua said, we should not have a society where the value of marginalized people is determined by how well they scale often impossible obstacles that others will never know. Consider your workplace or organization. Are there oppressive expectations for already marginalized people? If so, how can we lessen them, remove barriers, create more independent access? A large part of my work is community building and modeling how equity and accessibility can be achieved. The systems have failed disabled people, and so we engage in care work with one another. Within our network of community care, we know we can ask for what we need while still preserving our independence, integrity, and autonomy. We engage with each other and create and explore new ways of doing things and lessen our collective dependency on a system that has and continues to harm us and disregard our collective needs. It's a delicate balance, but it is so beautiful when it works. I do what I can to create a safer space and invite people to be an active part of community. I use the term safer instead of safe to recognize that people's experience with safety varies and that some people may not feel safe anywhere. I create an environment where truth and vulnerability is valued, recognized and appreciated. It is amazing work. I get to witness people undo the damaging teachings of suppressing themselves and their identities and create an environment where people can freely be their full selves, become who they hope to be and help others reclaim their authenticity. We lay bare our raw selves, speak our truths, acknowledge our limits and share our strengths. I have people who contact me after meetings to say that they feel lighter, that they feel like they finally have a place where they belong, and that they haven't felt that safe in a very long time. We need this type of collective care outside of the disability community as well. The photo on this slide shows a group of nine chronically queer members at a Vancouver Pride Parade. One member has a shirt that says mutant and proud and others are carrying signs that say, I am a lesbian, I have an invisible illness, I am proud. Spoiler alert, disabled people can be queer too. And my favorite, queer here and a pain in the ass for gender, for medical and gender systems everywhere. Every one of the chronically queer members have what we call medical PTSD, which is having trauma from being forced to interact with a medical system that actively works against them, is violent, and which often prevents them from feeling safe and accessing care as their authentic selves with all of their intersecting identities. This slide has an image of paper arms and hands joining to create a heart. Every person deserves respect and dignity, Collective liberation is the 10th principle of disability justice. It means recognizing that all of our struggles are interconnected. We must work together to create the kind of world we all need. The final principle is a call to action. Disability justice asks us to work together across the barriers that try to divide us and reminds us that by doing so strengthens us all. Our power is in our diverse identities and lived expertise. 
They give us as a collective the tools we need to dismantle the systems of oppression and create a world in which all people are recognized and valued. The principles ensure that no one is left behind or out of this movement. It is only by moving forward together that we can accomplish the revolution that we need. And your being here today is a step towards that collective liberation. Thank you. Luella, you're on mute. I didn't push hard enough. So I'll start again. Thank you for that, Heather. It's so important for us to be hearing about the role that community groups can play in making community spaces more accessible. And I thank you personally for bringing me to think about something that's happening at my workspace and now I have a better understanding. Thank you for that. Our next speaker is someone who will all be familiar, who will be familiar to most of you. Cheryl Burns, pronoun she, her, as a longtime labor, disability, and women's rights activist. She is the president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, or QP Local 1936, a general vice president of QPBC, and the Workers with Disabilities representative on the BC Federation of Labor's Executive Council. She is also a proud member of the BC government's Provincial Accessibility Committee. Cheryl? Thanks so much for that, Luella. I too am gonna attempt to share uh, my slides and I'm hoping that this works for me. Okay, there they are. So thanks, Lou. I wanna begin by acknowledging that I'm joining all of you from the unceded and occupied Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salaya Truth Indigenous peoples. And I actually wanna just take a moment to really reflect on what that means because I'm here with you on this panel presenting to you from colonized lands. And these are lands that were stolen by my descendants. And I think on the eve of National Truth and Reconciliation Day, it's really important to think about that and to think about what it means. And I want to thank my indigenous comrades for their generosity in allowing me to use these lands because they do so with complete generosity. So thank you for that. So um, we heard a wonderful definition of disability. So I'm not gonna repeat what's been said. Instead, I'm gonna move on to the next slide that's gonna elaborate a little bit more. So we heard from Heather that some people can live with visible disabilities, others live with invisible disabilities and that there's many different types of disabilities. So there's physical, sensory, psychological, communication, cognitive learning disabilities. And there's also disabilities that are related to what is commonly referred to as medical health issues, such as addictions issues, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and so on. And what's important to know is that some people are born with disabilities and others acquire their disability later in life. And disabilities can be constant and sometimes they don't change and sometimes they do evolve. Other disabilities might be episodic, which means that they come and they go. The important thing to know is that everyone's experience of living with a disability is unique. So for example, you can have two people that are hard of hearing, but their experience of living with a hearing disability might be completely different. And it could be based on the type of hearing loss that they have, but it could also be based on other sites of oppression, places where they're situated. So their experiences of living with a disability might be further complicated if they're also racialized. We heard about the high rates of disability among the indigenous community. They could also be a member of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. They could be a refugee or an immigrant, or they could be a woman. And so what we call this is multiple sites of oppression. And what this means is that someone might be experiencing oppression or discrimination on the basis of their disability, but they might also be experiencing oppression or discrimination on the basis of being indigenous. 
And so these two sites of oppression meet and they further complicate and challenge a person in life. So before I go on, I just want to share a common refrain that you hear in the disability rights community, and it's nothing about us without us. And the reason why this is so important to the disability community is that so often able-bodied people, often with good intentions, make decisions on our behalf and they do so without consulting with us first. So it's really important to make sure that you consult with us and that you work with us in helping us to meet our own needs. So I'm gonna jump ahead and talk a little bit about the Provincial Accessibility Committee. I'm not gonna repeat what Marjorie shared, but I do wanna share that I was um, fortunate to be appointed to this uh, Accessibility Committee about a year ago. As uh, Marjorie said, um, it's an act, the, it's, it's formed because of the Accessible British Columbia Act that received royal assent in June of 2021. And the PAC, as we call it for short, was formed by the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. And in determining who would sit on this particular committee, they looked at many different areas of diversity. So they looked at disability diversity, gender diversity, regional diversity. They wanted people from a variety of occupations. They wanted representation from labor. And they also wanted parents of children with disabilities throughout British Columbia. So, so far, the committee has focused on the development of standards as is required under the Accessible BC Act. And Marjorie talked a little bit about this. And the goal of the committee is to develop eight different standards. And we heard from Marjorie a little bit about what some of those standards might be. So right now the committee is developing two standards at a time and the government is in the process of selecting representatives for two technical committees that will focus on the development of the first two standards around employment and the provision of public services. So we did a lot of consultation about what standards should we start with? And based on what we were seeing in other jurisdictions, we felt that we should focus first on employment and then public services as well. And uh, you heard about this from Marjorie, so I'm not gonna repeat too much, but I do wanna say that there are 750 public sector organizations that are being required to implement accessibility committees and that committee will then have to develop an accessibility plan. They will then be required to build a tool that enables the public to provide feedback regarding those plans. And for most public sector organizations, this work must be accomplished by September 2023. And the government has provided the Disability Alliance BC with the money in order to distribute grants to organizations that are needing to meet these requirements. So the reason why we're working on why, I'm going to go back for a minute, but the reason why organizations are being required to develop these accessibility plans is that we want to create, as we talked about earlier, barrier-free communities and organizations and workplaces. And what, what that means in many cases is accommodating people with disabilities, meeting them where they're at, meeting them where their needs are. And so I want to talk a little bit about the duty to accommodate. And first, I want to talk about why is the duty to accommodate so important? And this is probably, it's not really rocket science. It's probably very logical to people. But the duty to accommodate is really important because people with disabilities may simply require some additional support to overcome barriers and to participate fully and to their full potential within their communities, in their workplaces, and even within their own homes. So right now, um, this slide has two images and they are side by side. And in both of the images, you see three individuals. One is an adult, one is a medium-sized child, and one is a very small child. And in the first image, all three of these individuals are standing on one crate and they have a fence in front of them. 
and there's a ball game playing. There's a word underneath the image that says equality. And what this means is that people are being treated the same regardless of their circumstances. And the result of this is in this picture, you see that the, chi the small child is not able to watch the ball game. They're simply looking at the fence. In the other image that's right next to the first image, the adult is not standing on a crate. The middle child is standing on one crate and is able to see over the fence and to see the ball game. And the small child is standing on two crates and is now also able to see the ball game. And the word equity is written under this image. And this is really what the duty to accommodate is about. It's about recognizing that we have differences and that those differences need to be accommodated in order to ensure that we can all participate fully in our society. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the duty to accommodate in an employment context. I'm going to um, provide a caveat that I'm not a lawyer. There are two lawyers in the room. They may be able to answer more questions. I'm simply providing an overview here. So first of all, employers are required to reasonably accommodate employees due to one or more of the protected grounds of discrimination as defined in the BC Human Rights Code. For federal employees, that would be defined in the Canadian Human Rights Code. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're talking about the protected ground of, of disability. So employers are supposed to provide accommodation to employees with disabilities when needed up to the point of undue hardship or unless they can prove a job requirement is a bona fide occupational requirement. So how do we define undue hardship? There's a few key factors that are taken into account. So one is the financial cost of the accommodation. And so in, in considering this, we also have to consider the size and the nature of the organization. So a large organization obviously is going to have more financial resources to provide accommodation, while a small family-owned organization or a small nonprofit organization isn't going to have the same financial resources. We also need to consider whether there's, there's a health and safety risk to the public to coworkers or to the individual requiring the accommodation. And then we need to consider whether there's an undue violation of a collective agreement. And undue is a key word here because the human rights code always supersedes a collective agreement. And in, in the case of unionized workplaces, there are actually four parties to a duty to accommodate. There's the employer, there's a union, there's a person requiring the accommodation, and then there's other coworkers. And the reason for that is because there's an expectation that everyone should have the opportunity to work regardless of disability or ability. And then finally, we need to consider the impact on the public. And then how do we determine whether or not there's a bona fide occupational requirement? I'm not going to go into the details of how this came to be, but the courts established the three-part test to prove a, what we call B4 for short. And employers have to be able to demonstrate that they can meet each part of this three-part test. So for example, they have to demonstrate that the job requirement has been adopted for a purpose that is rationally connected to the job, job performance. They also have to demonstrate that this requirement has been adopted in a good faith, honest belief that this particular requirement is absolutely necessary to the fulfillment of this particular job or task. And then finally, they have to demonstrate that this requirement is reasonably necessary to accommodate, to accomplish the legitimate work performance. So in short, employers can't refuse to provide accommodation because of a minor inconvenience. They have to be able to prove that providing an accommodation creates undue hardship and that, or that there's a bona fide occupational requirement. Everyone has the right to employment. 
regardless of ability. And as activists, we need to be role models and advocate for accommodations on behalf of people living with disabilities. And in this slide, there is a picture of a man in a wheelchair working in front of a computer. And it's just demonstrating that everyone should have access to the workplace. So what can we do to support people with disabilities? We can organize, and we heard some of this about some of this from Heather. So we can organize around the disability justice in the workplace, in the labor movement, and in our communities. But the first thing to do is to educate ourselves about the lived experiences of people with living with disabilities. And as I said earlier, always consult with people with disabilities first. They really are the experts on their own situations and their own needs. And then recognize that people with disabilities are often more capable than we may think, and they have the right to autonomy and self-determination. And then remember that a vast percentage of us are living with disabilities, and it can be 25% in the Indigenous community, it can be as high as 35% of us. And as Heather said, any one of us can become disabled at any time. So we can also create inclusive and ability smart spaces in our workplaces, unions, and in our communities. And again, we need to consult with people with disabilities and avoid making assumptions. We need to ensure physical accessibility, that ramps are in place where needed, that doorways are wide enough that for a large electric wheelchair to pass through, that elevators are large enough and that washrooms are fully accessible. We wanna ensure that spaces are well lit with the ability to dim light for those who might be sensitive to light. We wanna make sure that safety provisions such as fire alarms have light sensors so that those with hearing loss can be alerted to a fire. And it's important to create inclusive websites that everyone can access. We wanna provide voice recognition programs for those who have trouble with writing. And as activists, it's really important that we make space for people with disabilities. Step aside if need be. Start persons with disabilities advisory committees within our organization. Connect with people with disabilities because the more time that you spend with people with disabilities, the more you will be able to challenge your own stereotypes about people with disabilities and then challenge people who discriminate against or ridicule people with disabilities. Educate yourself about the duty to accommodate and use this knowledge to advocate for others. But most importantly, nothing about us without us. So thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you for your tireless work that you continue to do on all of our behalf. Thank you. Our final presenter is Kevin Love, pronouns he and him. Kevin is a lawyer in class community law program, working primarily in the areas of mental health and workers' rights. Kevin has represented clients at all levels of court, both federally and provincially, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Prior to joining the community law program, Kevin worked in the class mental health law program, representing clients who were detained in psychiatric facilities under the, community, under the criminal code. Kevin, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, normally I'd, I'd start with the um, with, with a land acknowledgement um, based on where I am today, but there's actually a point in the presentation um, that as I wrote it, it actually caused me to reflect um, um, a little more. And so I, I hope people will bear with me and, and let me um, um, uh, speak at a, a, a bit more of what I think is a, um, uh, an appropriate time. Um, you know, and, and before I jump in, I mean, this is the, the topic is uh, force and coercion in BC's mental health system. And I think I, I should say at the start, the perspective that that I I, I come at this from, um, I'm a lawyer at an organization who represents people who are detained for various reasons relating to mental health. 
um, or who have otherwise had their freedoms or liberties um, curtailed. Uh, that's not the same as speaking to you as someone who actually has the lived and living experience. And, you know, furthermore, it, 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 trying to draw generalizations um, is, you know, a bit of a, a dangerous game because of how individual and unique the interaction with the healthcare system can be for everyone. And I think Heather um, made that point quite well. Um, nonetheless, as the last speaker before a long weekend, um, you know, I will try to go beyond just telling you what the law is to give you a few of my thoughts, but I do acknowledge there is some danger um, in that. So if people want to jump in and feel comfortable, of course, um, feel free to, to add into the conversation. So if you could forward the slide, please, that would be great. So this, um, so this is just a chart to sort of set the stage. You know, I'll start talking with Mental Health Act detentions. So under the Mental Health Act, people can be involuntarily admitted to a hospital and held there. And what's really striking about this graph is, you know, if you rewind 15 years, um, you can see um, there's the light green line. That's the, the top line at the left of the screen. Um, that was voluntary admissions. And then the bottom line, uh, the blue line is involuntary admissions. And we see that voluntary admissions are way above involuntary admissions. Then fast forward um, to 2017, and we see that now the, the number of involuntary admissions has skyrocketed, is above voluntary admissions. Um, and the number of voluntary admissions has in fact not increased at all and actually by population has decreased. Um, so there's been a huge explosion in our use of um, forced coercion and involuntary care as a solution to um, providing mental health care. And if you could forward the slide, that would be great. And going forward even further, the trend is continuing. So we've got very, we got different data for 2020, 2021. Um, the ombudsperson did a report that I'll be referring to throughout the presentation. Uh, they put the number now up over 25,000 involuntary admissions. Um, some data we have from the ministry says it may be even a little higher, closer to 28. Um, but that doesn't really matter. It's high. It's high. And they more than doubled um, in the last 15 years. And as I mentioned, voluntary admissions have stayed the same and have actually decreased uh, compared to um, uh, population. So we have a, a healthcare system now that most people are not voluntarily engaging with. Um, and that's that to me is a scary thing. Uh, if we can forward the slide. Perfect. Thanks. Um, and when you're involuntarily admitted um, under the Mental Health Act, um, it's more than um, just a loss of liberty. Uh, it's a loss of control over your your health care. So nor in the normal um, you know, situations, any situation other than the Mental Health Act, um, there are certain fundamental elements of health care consent, uh, a presumption of capability for adults, and that doesn't get displaced without a meaningful assessment of your individual abilities. Um, the right to have treatment decisions respected if you are capable, uh, the right to use a representative to help make healthcare decisions if capacity is diminished that you choose, and the right to a substitute decision maker like a trusted family member, a trusted friend, if you are incapable and have no representative appointed. Um, but uh, Sandra, if you could forward the slide, um, when you're admitted under the Mental Health Act involuntarily, all that's gone. Uh, we have a system that deems you um, to be incapable uh, with respect to psychiatric treatment, the detaining, you're deemed to consent to any treatment the psychiatric facility wants to give you. And that's without any assessment of your individual actual ability to give or refuse uh, consent to treatment. And, you know, a lot of the previous speakers have really, um, you know, mentioned ideas of autonomy and, um, you know, it's a complete stripping of that and without any real correlation to the individual's real abilities. There's also no right to have a representative help you make treatment decisions that you choose um, through a representation um, agreement, which is a, a important planning tool that uh, many uh, people, particularly with 
disabilities use. Uh, there's no right to a substitute decision maker if incapable, you're in the hands of your doctor and the detaining facility. Um, this applies to not only people in facility, but people who are living on what's called extended leave in the community. They still have no control over their, their treatment. Um, and we're the last, this is a shame, I think, we're the last jurisdiction in Canada that's still clinging to this outdated model. Um, everywhere else has moved on. And if you could forward the slide. Um, and there's other consequences as well. Um, Mental Health Act detentions can continue indefinitely. You have to be assessed to see if you still meet the criteria, but there's no, it's not like a criminal sentence where it ends. Um, it, it, keeps, it keeps going until you're released. Um, solitary confinement, there's been a lot of um, legal work done about solitary confinement in prisons. Well, it's still really much, very much used in, in the mental health system. Uh, lengthy seclusion is still a very common practice. Um, which can be traumatic, uh, especially for, um, for people who have been recently admitted to hospital. Um, the facility has a statutory a, a power under the law to discipline you and control you. Um, and there was an ombudsperson review, and even the few safeguards that exist are being routinely disregarded. So, um, Cassandra, if you could forward the slide. You know, so this is a quote from an ombudsperson report. Um, the ombudsperson did a, a report about the compliance with um, uh, you know, Mental Health Act admissions and whether the facilities are doing what they're supposed to do. And um, the finding was all of the health authorities were non-compliant and well over half the files we reviewed. Across the province, the health authorities completed all the forms that are required only 28% of the time. Um, and that to me is appalling. Uh, that's that's um, it's 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 not just um, a, a large incursion into people's rights and liberties, but um, the the safeguards and the checks and balances just aren't being followed. Uh, so, if you could forward the slide, please, Sandra. Um, increasingly, um, we're seeing this what I call an obsession with involuntary care creep into other areas outside of the Mental Health Act as well. So this is a case um, our office uh, did a while back um, where um, an Indigenous woman was detained for 11 months without legal authority as a quote unquote emergency under the Adult Guardianship Act. The Adult Guardianship Act is different than the um, Mental Health Act. Um, it is supposed to, um, it's supposed to be there to protect adults who are abused or neglected. Um, when she tried to leave, police did, tried to go home, police would return her to hospital. Um, and the argument was, of course, we're locking you up for your own good. Uh, you know, there were allegations she was being um, abused by men. Um, you know, it, it, and so we filed a, um, an application for habeas corpus, uh, various charter relief, and the court found that um, this kind of unchecked detention violated numerous charter rights, the right to be free from arbitrary detention, uh, right to reasons for detention, right to counsel. Um, and of course, the interesting thing here is who got locked up, right? Like who, who got locked up for 11? It's the person who was alleged to have been abused, not the person doing the, the abuse. And so this is the point, as I mentioned at the outset, where, you know, it caused me to kind of reflect a little more, you know, and the first thing I reflect of, you know, um, you know, I've seen these powers used on white men, of course, I, I have, but, you know, I, I, I do wonder, um, you know, this 11 months for your own good, you know, what role did it play that, you know, our client was an Indigenous woman, um, you know, in terms of the paternalism, right? And, um, you know, I can't obviously go beyond what's in the decision because of things like um, uh, uh, privilege and confidentiality, but, you know, the, the decision refers repeatedly to her, you know, trying to get home. And, you know, uh, home has, um, you know, perhaps a different meaning. It's more than a house, right? Um, for for Indigenous people, you know, and so it's, it's at this point that it causes me to reflect to that connection to 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 place um, for Indigenous people, um, and you know, I, of course, I am um, you know a settler on the lands I, I live on, and you know, I just again just to recognize uh, that sense of home and 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 um, you know ownership of the land for. Um, uh, for Indigenous people, and uh, it is important, especially on a day like today, to uh, to recognize that, of course. Um, if you could forward the slide, that would be great. Thanks. Um, 
And we're also seeing it creep into overdose response. Um, so a little while back, the government pro proposed new powers to detain uh, youth who overdose, uh, to involuntarily detain youth who, who overdose. Uh, that bill was withdrawn after public pushback. Um, but recently in the news, there have been um, new proposals for expanded powers to detain adults who um, repeatedly uh, who repeatedly overdose. And, you know, this, there's a surface logic, you know, that, that, you know, we can just lock people away and magically they'll be better. But, um, you know, as, as we'll, we'll come to in the next slide, um, I, I don't think this is, is, is working. Uh, so if you, if we could, um, you know, if we just look around at, you know, leave, leaving aside the human toll here, I, involuntary care, and this is just, my humble opinion is not working. It just it just isn't. Um, we have a situation where people trying desperately to access services can't, um, and we're dedicating more and more resources to detaining people. Um, this is causing real harm uh, to people. Um, and furthermore, people um, who are more likely to people are more likely to voluntarily engage, and this is what I hear from the clients we interact with, more likely to voluntarily engage with mental health systems if they feel respected that they're going to be treated as a human um, and they're less likely to engage if engaging with the healthcare system can lead to a total loss of control and, and autonomy, uh, if that can be the result. So uh, if you could forward the, uh, the slide, Cassandra. Um, and uh, you know, another, another interesting consequence of involuntary care, of course, is the role of police and law enforcement. So. Um, you know, you can see in this chart, uh, British Columbia hadn't had data for a long time, but, you know, the RCMP are reporting 65,000 plus Mental Health Act occurrences a year. It dipped in 2020, and that's just likely because of the isolation due to COVID, if I was going to guess. I don't know. Um, now, uh, you know, I'll say at the outset, uh, trying to equate this between provinces, that's not the purpose here. Like Ontario and Quebec have their own police forces. So it makes sense you wouldn't see a lot of RCMP. So I'm not trying to, although the BC number is huge, um, I wouldn't put it forward to try to do a direct comparison um, because I think we'd need to go deeper in terms of you know, what police force is doing what, but it's a big number. Um, and for the, um, uh, and if you go forward the slide, um, for the VPD part, the VPD, I couldn't find any data on uh, contacts, but there, the VPD is um, uh, apprehending between, you know, 4,400 and 4,900 people under the Mental Health Act annually. Um, and uh, that's gone up substantially in the last 15 years. Um, and the difficulty I would say is that what we're hearing is that people are starting to see the healthcare system as an, ex as an extension of the criminal system. Uh, they feel criminalized. Um, there's a lack of demographic data that I can find, but um, just, you know, I'll piggyback on what the previous speakers um, spoke about in terms of what we know about interactions with healthcare, police, um, and the criminal justice system. I, it's probably reasonable to assume um, that um, uh, BIPOC and other marginalized individuals are going to be disproportionately impacted by over policing. I, I, you know, I don't have the data, but I think I, I'd be prepared to hazard a guess that's that's true. Um, and if you could forward the slide, that. So I'll just conclude with, um, you know, again a way forward, and you know, again what I said at the start, um, you know, uh, and you know what other speakers have noted. Um, uh, you know, the, the, it's critical that we involve any, you, we need to involve the people impacted, the people with lived experience, the people with living experience when we chart a way forward. So I don't put this forward to say that I have the answers, but um, it would seem to me that we need um, an overhaul of our outdated Mental Health Act um, to create something that respects people as individuals, not stereotypes respects their individual abilities and respects their right to use representatives, trusted friends and family members, and more importantly, to create robust and independent oversight uh, uh, to protect rights and to ensure accountability. Um, detention should be a last resort, not the first tool. 
Uh, we shouldn't jump to detention as the solution to everything because I just don't think it is. Um, I think we need to question the use of police in responding to mental health crises. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I put in brackets, eliminate me, you know, I, I don't want to um, try to minimize what, you know, police have to do every day. And then there are very difficult situations, um, but they may not be the right responder in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, and let's allocate resources to provide uh, better access to voluntary services so that people who um, are trying to get to services can. Um, so that I think, um, uh, mercifully for all of you uh, before a long weekend concludes uh, my presentation, but of course I'm happy to uh, uh, take questions and, um, and, uh, and hear any response or, or feedback. Can I add to your um, ways to move forward? Oh, please. Uh, it's to support community organizations that are doing this work as well. Um, for example, Chronically Queer is the only space that a lot of our members can talk about their suicidal ideations without having to be reported. Um, and as much as we're glad to offer them that space, I'm not a professional psychologist or counselor, and it really shouldn't be on community members to be the only place where they can talk about that. We also have um, mechanisms in place where they can report that they're feeling suicidal on social media, but every single time that they post, they are very um, specific about the fact that you cannot call police to help them. Um, we have a lot of trans members, which are you're seven times more likely to be involved in police fatalities. 42% uh, of people who are in police fatalities were in mental distress. Um, so that scares quite a lot of our members. And uh, some of our members have some very serious trauma from police interactions, trauma that's actually worse than what the original call was for. Um, and so I think community uh, organizations are doing a lot of this work. Um, we've got guides on how to help people figure out who can be, uh, you know, kind of what level of support to each other and how people can say yes or no to being support because of course we need mental health support for both the people who need the support but also for the people who are providing support um, and uh, I often see that the community organizations are left out of those conversations because it is so focused on the medical model. Yeah thanks Heather I think that's uh, I think amazing. That's such an important Thank you, Kevin. That was a really thought-provoking presentation and really forward-looking. Would you all join me in showing appreciation for the panelists? You can use your reaction or you can clap. That would be awesome. This evening has been so informative, so relevant, relevant and so timely. So thank you once again to our panelists for sharing with the group. I'm sure many of us will be having conversations sparked by this event for quite some time in the future. Thank you to all of you who took time out of your evenings to be part of this conversation and have a good rest of your night, everyone, and a reflective day tomorrow on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Thank you and good night. Thank you, everyone.